Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My apologies for the slight delay. We had a stuck space bar giving us some trouble there. Um, I'm Cheryl Rogers, the Director of Marketing here at Golden Helix. And today's presentation will be from our first place winner in this year's annual abstract challenge, Dr. Folafak Ammon King. Dr. Ammon King will present his work at the University of British Columbia and the Canadian Pharmacogenetics Network for Drug Safety surrounding the pharmacogenetic prediction of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity. With that, Folafak, I will give you the mic. Thank you so much, Chair, and I want to welcome everybody to this webcast from Golden Helix. I also want to thank the Golden Helix for organizing this competition and also for selecting me as their first place winner. I also want to mention that one of the most important awards for me is the work that we do here at the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for Drug Safety for Children that are diagnosed with cancer. As most of you may already be aware, uh, cancer is a very devastating disease. So for my presentation of this morning, I will give a background to the work that we do here in Vancouver and across Canada, and then talk about uh, uh, this big study that we published in Nature Genetics last September and discuss the importance of SVS in dealing with big data sets. So just some background to the work that we do here in Vancouver. Um, I assume most of you are physicians, as you may already be aware, uh, all medications that are approved for use in patients are designed to effectively treat diseases and and prevent um, uh, um, are designed to effectively treat and prevent diseases and not to have adverse effects. And this is based on data from clinical trials that demonstrate the safety of these medications in the first place for them to be approved for use in patients. But the problem with clinical trials is that they are conducted in a fairly homogeneous population. So um, homogeneous, I mean that the variables are tightly controlled. But in a real-world clinical situation, physicians have to treat a patient population that is very heterogeneous. So as a consequence, the drug response is bound to be highly variable. There's huge variability in the way patients respond to medication. And that variability remains a continuum from the drug being effective to the drug not having an effect in specific patients and the development of adverse drug reactions. And we here at the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for Drug Safety are particularly interested in studying the adverse effects to medication. So over the last 10 years, we've been studying a particular class of drugs known as the anthracyclines. And this includes compounds such as doxorubicin, donorubicin, idarubicin, apirubicin, virubicin, and mitoxitrin. So this class of drug is prescribed for use for treatment of a variety of cancer in children and for the treatment of breast cancer in adults. And at least one million people in North America receive this drug. This drug is highly effective, contributing to at least 80% uh, survival of um, cancer in children. And this is really huge if you consider the fact that one in every 750 young adults is a cancer survivor. And the problem with this drug is the development of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity, which is detectable in one in every two patients that is treated with this drug and one in every five treated patients is actually going to go ahead and develop congestive heart failure after some cancer treatment. And the risk of developing anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity and congestive heart failure is particularly high in children that are diagnosed with cancer under the age of four, four. So this publication that, uh, this study, this large study that we published in Nature Genetics last September actually deals with um, this drug and the development of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity and congestive heart failure. So in the beginning, we asked the question that what are the genetic factors that modify the risk of developing anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity <clears throat> and can potentially inform treatment decisions. As most of you are already aware of, um, every good research project has to begin with good research questions. What I mean by good research questions is that the questions have to be well-defined and concise. So to answer that research question, we develop an analysis pipeline, which is implemented in the SNP and variation systems from, S, from Golden Helix. And I'm going to go through um, the different steps a little bit in more details in my subsequent slides. So essentially, this analysis plan involves a quality control step, which involves the exclusion of poor quality data. Um, then we have the next step is a discovery analysis, which involves the screening and prioritization of important candidates for follow-up. 
then a replication, which is all the identification of the associated region, then a fine mapping step where we actually zoom into the associated region to identify the causal variants. And the last step is where we actually demonstrate the biological plausibility of this genetic association. So a little bit more details about this analysis plan that we use and how this is implemented in SVS. You can see on this slide. So the first step, which involved the exclusion of uh, poor quality data, uh, there are a couple of metrics in SVS that can actually help to exclude to, ex to exclude poor quality data. And for samples, you have metrics such as uh, call rate estimation. You can actually check. Uh, gender mis mismatches. You can also look at samples that are related and also population stratification. And for SNP specifically, SVS also has metrics such as estimating the call rates uh, and also minor alert frequencies where you can actually exclude um, uh, uh, genetic variations that are very rare and also highly one well equilibrium. Then uh, in the second step, which is the discovery analysis, which involves the screening and prioritization of important candidates for follow-up, SVS actually provides a variety of statistical tests to perform all this analysis, which have to do, and, and the specific tests that you're going to select to use to this, do this analysis depends on your data set and also on your research question. Then the next step is the replication, which involves the identification of the associated region, and again, SVS provides a variety of statistical tests to perform all this analysis, which largely depends on your data set and also the choice of your research question. And finally, there is the fine mapping step, which you can either do by imputation or sequencing. And of course, when you have all these data, you can actually bring it and analyze it in, in SVS. So SVS is a really powerful tool in terms of dealing with large data sets. And this is what we've used for the last 10 years, and this is actually what we use uh, for the large study that I'm going to talk about in, in a moment. So for all the patients that we included in this study that we published in Nature Genetics last year, um, all of them were children that were treated with anthocyclines, and the study was actually designed to have a discovery uh, which consisted of European patients recruited from Canada, then an independent replication which consisted of also European patients recruited from the Netherlands, and then um, uh, uh, it, it was also designed to have a replication in other non-European populations. Of course, we didn't just want to have genetic associations where the relevance has all, all only been demonstrated in European patients. We also wanted to see um, the relevance of any genetic association that we would identify in other worldwide populations. And the populations we included were Africans, Latinos, Aboriginal Canadians, and East Asians. So for the genomic analysis, we decided to use a genome-wide association study, as I already mentioned a while ago. And this is an approach that involves a large amount of data. And that's why for this kind of uh, large and complex data analysis, you actually require a very powerful computational tool as SVS. So a little bit about what genome-wide association studies are. GWAS, as it is now known, examines genetic variations across the entire genome. It is an approach that is unbiased and hypothesis-free, and it specifically targets common variation. And it is extremely powerful in terms of the discovery of new genes, variants, and new pathways involved in drug response phenotype, and also other disease phenotype. And this can potentially inform future drug development. And for this study that we published in Nature Genetics, the, uh, the, 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 the genome-wide assay that we used was an Illumina panel, which actually had a 7 of 3,000 SNP coverage across the genome. And I also want to mention that this was the first genome-wide association study for anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity that was published. So a little bit about the results from uh, this genome-wide association study. So the figure you see on your screen right now is known as the Manhattan plot for those of you that are not geneticists. So the red line that you see here is our screening and prioritization threshold. And everything above this red line are important candidates that we actually prioritize for follow-up in an independent replication. And this red line corresponds to a p-value threshold 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. And this is a threshold that has been used by the Human Genome Research Institute for the selection, for the screening of putative genetic associations. So in this genome-wide association study, we actually uncover a new gene for anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity known as retinoid acid receptor gamma, or RAG, as I'll be referring to it subsequently in my uh, 
uh, in my uh, subsequent slides. So within this gene, we actually identify a uh, coding variant, the RS2229774, to be highly associated with anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity in Canadian patients, then replicated it in the Dutch patients, both of which are all European populations. And we went further to demonstrate uh, independent replications in other worldwide populations of typically non European populations, including Africans, Hispanic, Aboriginal Canadians and East Asians. So then the next step was that we zoom into this associated region and identified uh, um, a five sleep haplotype to be associated with anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity. And in this haplotype that we identified to be associated with anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity, the RS2229774, which is the coding variant that we had initially identified in this um, um, uh, region was the only coding variant in that haplotype. So we then prioritized this variant and the gene for follow up in our uh, functional studies. So now, on to the functional studies that we did. Uh, like I said a while ago, when we find this genetic association, we have to be able to demonstrate the biological plausibility. And the first thing we did was to show that the retinal acid receptor gamma transcriptionally regulates top 2B. Now, for most of you that have been following the anthracycline literature, uh, literature on anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity, top 2B has been shown to cause anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity in mouse. Then we went further to show that the variant is actually impaired in the regulation of top 2B. So, the key findings coming out of this Nature Genetics publication that we published last September was that. Uh, that we actually found a new gene for anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity known as retinal acid receptor gamma. We also discovered a new variant, which is the RS2229774, which is a coding variant, and it's a non synonymous coding variant. And we also identify a new haplotype for anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity. We also went further to show that the retinal acid receptor gamma and the coding variant, the RS2229774, regulates top 2 b And as I mentioned a while ago, top 2 b has been shown to cause anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity in mouse. So, in conclusion, the retinal acid receptor gamma coding variant, the RS2229774, is a new pharmacogenomic marker for anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity and provides new insight into the pathophysiology of this drug response. Phenotype. Now, I know a lot of you listening to this presentation will be wondering where we go next after having had these great results and published a major paper in Nature Genetics. So, the first thing we are doing is to study the, the genetic association of the retinal acid receptor gamma, the coding variant, the RS2229774 in adults. The results that we had published in Nature Genetics were in children. And the way we are doing that is we are looking at the association of this coding variant in adult cohort of metal or breast cancer patients. And we are also doing some mechanistic studies on this gene and the variant, and we believe that our data is definitely going to inform future drug development in a number of ways, including the development of less heart failure prone cancer treatments and the development of more advanced, advanced cardioprotectants. So for most of you that are physicians, you know that um, um, since most of these drugs cause adverse drug reactions for anthracyclines, cardiotoxicity, um, if the patient really has to take the drug, physicians sometimes they like to give a protectant to protect the heart. But uh, just by understanding how this gene and the variant are involved in the development of anthracycline in this cardiotoxicity, I think that's going to help in terms of being able to develop better cardioprotectant than what we currently have today. So uh, we also have a collaboration with a Stanford-based NIH project that is studying the rule of this retinal acid receptor gamma and the coding variant, the RS2229774, in the development of anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity using the real-world patient populations. So I think I know this is also going to be interesting for physicians. So on the implementation end, we have a pilot project that is actually implementing pharmacogenomic testing for this variant and the other variants that we had initially identified in our previous studies at the BC Children's Hospital. And the plan is to be able to rule out that pilot project across Canada. So um, for most of you that are physicians, uh, especially people that are oncologists, you know that clinical factors have, are currently being used to inform treatment decisions in, 
in cancer patients. And for the case of anthracycline, anthracycline induced cardiotopicity, age and radiation will potential impact to the heart, and anthracycline dose uh, being used to inform uh, treatment decisions for patients. So the first thing we did was to demonstrate that genetic factors that significantly improve the prediction of anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity beyond this currently implemented clinical risk factors and can potentially inform treatment decisions. You can see that this blue line is a prediction based on clinical risk factors and the green line is the green line is a prediction when genetic factors are actually added into the, into the prediction model. So um, the next thing was that we actually now developed the polygenic um, um, visual communication tool for genetic risk classification for anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity. And what this polygenic visual communication tool does is that it actually stratifies patients into groups that are at high risk of developing anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity, the group that has moderately of developing anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity, and also the group that has low risk for developing anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity. So this is a typical example of um, a patient that, based on our polygenic risk model and uh, the genetic testing that we are currently performing here at BC Children's Hospital was determined to be at genetically high risk of developing anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity. And when you can plot this visually on this plane, it communicates the risk better to physicians and your family. And this can better inform treatment decisions just far beyond um, um, what is currently used to make decisions for the treatment of patients. So, like I said, SVS is a very powerful computational tool in dealing with large data sets, and we've been using this software for the last 10 years, and that's actually what we use in nature genetics. The problem with big data sets is that you have all this huge amount of genetic variants, and what you need now to do is to be able to have computational tools that can actually help you extract maybe the one or two variants that are important for your phenotype that you're interested in. And for us in pharmacogenomics, we're actually interested in drug response phenotype. And for me in particular, I'm actually interested in the development of anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity and the of severe phenotype, which is a congestive heart failure. So this software from Golden Helix is actually well suited for big and complex data analysis, visualization, and interpretation, and it has actually found specific application in pharmacogenomic studies to uncover the genetic and mechanistic basis of drug response. So 10 reasons why SVS remains our software's choice here at the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for drug safety. First, it's very user-friendly and it's great for beginners. You don't have to be a statistician or a bioinformatician to use this SVS in order to produce, in order to do some great work and produce great papers. It also has a very detailed user manual available on the website, which is also relatively easy to use. It has a wide range of statistical tests that you can use, and like I said a while ago, you, you have to, the tests you're going to use for your studies will actually depend on the type of data that you have and the nature of your research questions. It's great for data visual visualization. It's very fast and has lots of computational power. It has great variety of data manipulation tool, and this is the most fascinating part. The tech support is great and it is rapid. Uh, just from a personal experience, I remember three years ago that when I was doing some analysis for the Singaporean pharmacogenomics project, there was a specific question which I was trying to answer and the tools were not available in SVS at that time. And at lunch time, I just put in a request to Greta and by the time I came back from lunch, I had a Python free of charge, of course, that I was able to use to do my analysis. And of course, busy scientists like us are not patient when we really want to get stuff done. Also, um, it has lots of tutorials and training available on the website. And the cool thing about SVS and Golden Helix, which is producing this software, is that it's constantly investing heavily in the education and training of its customers on a wide variety of topics. So not only on the software, but on a wide variety of topics in, uh, in, in other disciplines, including medical and biomedical sciences. And that's the reason why uh, someone like me is able to give this presentation to you. So we are not only talking about the software, we are also educating everyone that uses SVS on its different applications and what this software can do in terms of being able to produce great results that can actually have a big impact on the life of patients. So that's, an, um, uh, um, that's something that I really also find fascinating about the software and the producers. 
And I think that with the amount of genetic data growing faster than the computational capacity of most standard statistical software packages, SVS is definitely going to be the software of choice, especially for scientists and clinicians who are neither statisticians nor bioinformaticians. So um, I'd like to end this presentation by thanking all the members uh, uh, of the Canadian Pharmacogenomics Network for Drug Safety. There's just a lot of names that I can go through one after another. And this network actually includes um, many side investigators, most of them are physicians and scientists and also a lot of trainees. I also want to particularly thank our national surveillance network that is led by Claude Hildebrand. Um, to do all the hard work in terms of recruiting the patients across Canada and performing a detailed clinical characterization, which is really important for pharmacogenomic studies, or which is also really important for studying any phenotype. It doesn't matter whether it's a drug response phenotype or disease phenotype. Um, and of course, I also want to thank our other collaborators from around the world, um, especially from the United States and the Netherlands. And I think I've done a pretty good job of staying on time. I think we still see, we see, see have plenty of time for questions. So over to you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Paula Fack. Um, as Paula Fack mentioned, we do have plenty of time left for questions. So feel free to enter those into the questions pane. I have a couple of quick announcements. Um, of course, I'll be recording, or I am recording, the webcast, and I will have that up on the website tomorrow, and I shall email you a link to the recording. Our next webcast will be on May 11th, and it will surround TRIO analysis. I will e email out more details to everyone soon. Um, for those of you who might be going to ESHG this year in Barcelona, we are super excited to return for the first time in quite some time. Um, Gabe Rudy will be representing the Golden Helix team and he'll be in booth 378. I will have more info regarding the demo times and t-shirt giveaways soon up on our blog, our two snips. And if you haven't seen it yet, we did release a, a new ebook yesterday, um, which surrounds teaching bioinformatics and I did email it to everyone. If you didn't happen to get it, you can hop on our website and you will find all of our ebooks under the resource section. All righty. Let's take a look. If you've got any questions, feel free to go ahead and type those in. I'm not seeing any at this point. Um, so we can go ahead and wrap for today. And I thank everyone in attendance, and we will see you next time. Follow Fec, thank you so much for a great presentation. Thank you so much, Jerry. Have a great day, everyone. You too.